Well, welcome everybody to this session. Um, towards new drivers of growth. My name's Phil Smith. I'm uh, Reuters News Editor for North Asia. Just moved to China, so I'm quite new to this region. Um, the last time I was in Seoul was uh, 10 years ago, <coughs> excuse me, um, just after the Asia crisis had hit. And uh, it was a very different place. Uh, and this is a very different crisis. Uh, when you look back at the, the causes of the Asia crisis, this particular crisis and recession is not homegrown in Asia. Um, and when you look back over the last century, recessions rooted in banking crises have tended to be very bad, and recessions that have been multi-country have tended to be very bad. Um, unfortunately, this is both. So it brings with it a different set of challenges and a different set of um, solutions right across the spectrum from corporates to banking, to the actual economy, to people, to demographics. And today we've got a very good panel, a, a, a quite a diverse panel. <clears throat> and we hope uh, in this next session to come up with some actual concrete answers perhaps, or at least some ideas that you can take away and think about, about this particular region and the drivers of growth. I was looking at some of the GDP numbers the other day where you've got Russian GDP falling off a cliff this year. It's expected to recover next year, but when you look at growth in countries like China and India, it's actually not come back that far. So there's very, very different scenarios in different countries. You know, this is not a one-size-fits-all type of policy. So I'll briefly introduce the panel members now. Um, on my immediate right here, Michael Kim. Uh, Michael is the founding partner of MBK Partners here in Korea, and he's very much a Korea expert in this region. Um, Dominic Barton, he's a director of McKinsey and Company. Uh, he's currently in Shanghai, moving to London soon. His Excellency, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam, Hung Trong Hai, who is going to be giving us uh, a country-specific, I hope, perspective on what's going on. Uh, next to him is Kim Jung. Um, he's president of Bell Labs. <clears throat> so he's our corporate head on the panel, um, a company man, but more importantly, a technology man, very interested in innovation and ways to bring out the best in companies from a technology point of view. And on the end, Max Berger Cauldron, um, private equity expert um, based in Hong Kong, who will, could, is going to, I hope, give us a good view investment-wise on the region in general. So maybe, um, Deputy Prime Minister, can I come to you first? Um, what is, not so much what is happening in Vietnam, but what is the government there looking at particularly to help pull the economy around? What are the particular areas of interest to you? Thank you. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, that uh, Vietnam was doing quite well for the last 20 years until uh, the beginning of 2008, where uh, we faced the inflation in the beginning of the year and facing the uh, depressions in uh, the end of the year. Uh, however, the year 2008 was uh, experiencing, you know, 6.23 percent of the uh, GDP growth. Uh, for 2009, the uh, country is facing uh, even more difficult with the, you know, uh, impacts of the the world crisis. Uh, however, the uh, signal for the last number of months that's showing that the economy is starting to uh, uh, stop re reducing and starting to picking up uh, the uh, economy for the first quarter of the year was 3.1 percent of GDP and the um, industry is, is month by month it's, it's increasing. Uh, the government was actually uh, applying the, uh, a number of, of measures to um, overcome the, the impacts of the crisis where we are uh, concentrating on the package of the economic st stimulus. We are concentrating in the uh, investment in the infrastructures like the power system, uh, the uh, port, the road transportation, and other infrastructure system as well. Uh, we concentrating on the investment 
in the uh, rural area and to help the small and medium enterprises with their uh, you know, uh, capital investments and with assisting them to uh, maintain the labor employment. So uh, the economy actually get the benefits from that you know, stimulus package and it, it is getting uh, smoothly uh, going up. And we believe that to the end of the year, the economy will achieve something like 5% of GDP this year, uh, 2009. And coming up, coming back to uh, it's about 6.5% in 2010. Okay, Jung, at the other end of the scale, what about companies? What about technology? What about innovation? It's, it's got to be vital for this recovery. So let me offer the perspective from the industry I'm, com I'm coming from. And uh, I'm from the telecommunications industry, as many of you know, that the telecom industry went through boom and bust during the internet and telecom uh, boom and bust cycle in the you know, late 2000 through 2003. And still undergoing through major transformation primarily driven by advancement in technology, but uh, also driven by you know, ever-increasing human desire for interconnectivity and interactions. Um, you know, it, this actually, the crisis brings something very interesting. Um, when industry is going through transformation, you are, re you are facing a, a resistance to change. People just don't like changes. But when you're in a crisis, it gives you an opportunity to actually accelerate the change. So I'd like to offer perhaps a three points with regards to a making necessary change to, uh, to deal with the crisis and perhaps uh, transformation. First is that uh, you have to invest for the future. And that, has, that effort has to be separate from a, a uh, managing crisis. You know? And often corporations deal with a reducing expenses uh, to deal with a crisis. And that leaves very little room for any kind of investment for the future. But you know, managing crisis is very different than managing growth. Managing crisis requires people with a performance mindset, people um, a, uh, who, who are really focused on operational efficiencies. And, and uh, you know, growing business requires different set of a mindset. It really requires growth mindset. And people are really focused on the vision and making a narrow set of bets um, that is aligned with the vision. Um, back in a, uh, you know, a, a year 2000 time frame, I was running the optical networking business, and uh, it was a multi-billion dollar business that we were running, and I had 16 different lines of product, um, and you know, I had about a billion dollar uh, R&D um, a, a expense, and I had to allocate about 20, 25% of that for the a, you know, future product. So we actually you know, launched four different, four, four different uh, product, uh, which allow us to actually, when the crisis is over, have a set of product to, to build up the uh, uh, business in the growth area. Second is that the, you know, corporations need to embrace open innovations. In the, the past, you, know, you try to innovate inside the world, um, it's really over. It, nobody has enough resources to do all the things by yourself. By embracing open innovations, you can actually develop solutions that are better, faster, and make a bigger impact. And if you look at a company like I, you know, Apple, if you look at the, a, a background on how iPod was developed, it's pretty amazing. Apple is not known for a company as a, you know, embracing open innovations, and yet it is a company that with a small group of a, you know, a, a engineers and business leaders got together and, and uh, architected and developed the entire iPod, iTunes, in a matter of you know, six months time frame. Matter of fact, key engineer, architect wasn't even an Apple engineer, he was a consultant. And, and innovation was not only on the technology side, but on the business side as well. One of the challenges for you know, embracing open innovation is how do you handle intellectual property? You know, companies often develop intellectual property and get the patents and whatnot, and use that patents as a defensive measure. But in the world of open innovations, you gotta put that you know, intellectual property in the open and share that with others and collaborate, but somehow to leverage that um, to a to benefit of the company. So this concept of a cooperation, you know, cooperate but at the same time compete with your a 
colleagues in, in other companies is kind of an art that you have to master. And the final a point that I'd like to make is, during this kind of crisis, government has a, a unique and very important role to play. Government is probably the only entity that can actually have sufficient capital and long-term perspective in the, um, uh, in the areas that, um, that guide industry to uh, foster growth. Um, you know, you talk about the financial crisis back in 1997 here. Um, I clearly remember a Korean government has consciously decided to invest in the, a, uh, putting out the infrastructure for broadband, broadband access throughout the country. And uh, you know, look at the results today. About 13% of GDP is related to ICT, I, um, in, uh, um, a, a, um, ICT sector, and they really lift some burden off the manufacturing export-led businesses here. Um, as I see in the future, today in the future, I see a limitations on um, the technology that is available to maintain the growth in the uh, telecommunications and ICT sector. We are already you know, pushing the limit of uh, a dear, you know, physical limits for wireless you know, and uh, uh, even the fiber optic, um, pushing you know, what our geeks call channel limits. Uh, I see ever uh, increasing explosion of amount of information that is being created and stored and whatnot, primarily driven today by video, but in the future by uh, sensor networks. So if you talk to my scientists and technologists, they said with current technologies, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot get there, you cannot scale. You know, we, know, we can apply all the known tricks and there's only limitations. So uh, governments around the world, and particularly in Asia, I think should spend some time thinking about investing money in fundamental science and technology in the area that they want to guide their industry. And uh, only you know, government can actually partner with academia and industry to make that happen. Okay, thank you. Dominic, can I come to you next? With, um, what, are, what are companies coming to you with at the moment? As management consultants, what's their biggest query with you? Well, I think, Phil, obviously it's around the crisis has been the main, uh, main issue, but I, I I don't think I want to spend too much time talking about that. I think we all have our different views about where we are in that. I think that what um, we find a useful thing to think about is some of the medium to long-term trends, particularly in Asia, uh, that we should keep in mind while we're going through the crisis. And there may be three or four just to put on the table, which I think um, are really one about a massive opportunity. And the first is that we basically, basically are going to see anywhere in the order of 800 to 1 billion new consumers, uh, primarily in the Asia region, in China, India, to some extent Vietnam with this incredibly young dynamic population, and then uh, to some extent in Africa. But 1 billion new consumers coming into the middle class, which I think represents on any order of magnitude uh, huge opportunities for companies in this region, but also in other regions. So if you're in the financial services business and you look at profit pools around the world, no matter what your view is of how bad this crisis will be or how long it will last, most of the growth is going to be coming from this region. So we're going to see, I think, some significant growth if you're in consumer finance, wealth management, actually capital markets, some of the stuff that's not so popular right now given what's happened. There's actually a big need for the development of, uh, of capital markets. So investment banking actually we'll see, in my view, uh, growth in, uh, in this region. So a billion new consumers. Uh, if you look at healthcare, uh, many people call the 21st century the healthcare century. Uh, the expenditure that is going to be put out on healthcare is at a, at a scale we'll have not seen before. It has been growing at about 2% more than the GDP growth. Uh, and again, given the development of that billion uh, consumers in these populations, there's some fundamental uh, issues, I think also opportunities for companies. Education is a third area. Right now it's about a two trillion dollar market. Uh, we think that it's a market that's going to grow both from a public sector point of view but particularly a private sector point of view in this region uh, in, in, on the order of 25 to 30 percent a year. It's a very large opportunity. There are many major players actually in this country, uh, in, in Korea. A fourth area is actually around climate change. Uh, climate change, you can see, is, a, is obviously a big challenge that we all have to face. 
If you look at the capital expenditure required to deal with that in this region, it's about $155 billion a year. We think that will have to go up to about $300 billion a year just on various areas of clean technology. Another area, by the way, that uh, the Korean government is taking a strong role in trying to drive and, and create opportunities uh, on that side. And I think that represents new investments, new opportunities for people. And the final area I might talk about is just infrastructure in general. Uh, that's about a 10 trillion plus market over the next seven years uh, globally. About half of that will be in Asia. It'll be in places like Vietnam where there's the need for uh, power plants, uh, railways, roads, and so forth. Our view, for example, on the China infrastructure program, which is a massive, as you know, stimulus program, even with that, in our view, there's not white elephants that are being built. That place still has much more infrastructure that's required. So again, that I think creates huge opportunities uh, that are out there. And I think when we're thinking about the crisis, let's remember those trends, which in my, at least myopic view, are more like gravity. They're, they're going to happen whether you, you like it or not. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to be seized. Michael, can I come to you next, specifically on the recovery in this area, Dominic was talking about the opportunities and the kind of uh, the demographic of what's happening in Asia. What are the opportunities for this region? Is it going to? Are we going to see the recovery come from here? When um, Zhao Enlai, the uh, former Chinese premier in the 60s and 70s, was asked what he thought of the French Revolution, he replied, "It's too soon to tell." Uh, I feel that way about the uh, the recovery here uh, happening today. The stock markets, yes, have surged, um, credits have narrowed, but I think it's entirely too early to tell. So we will see over the next uh, several months uh, how that plays out. I think the key will be, can East Asia decouple from the West, and particularly U.S.? Uh, I think it's going to depend on domestic consumption, and in particular, uh, consumption out of China. Uh, I think everyone knows China is now Korea's largest trading partner and uh, Japan's largest trading partner. So what China does uh, to get out of this crisis will determine how East Asia follows. Max, what about investment in general in this, in this region? It's a banking crisis, money's been tight. There's a huge amount of money been thrown at the system, as liquidity always is thrown at any crisis. Where do we sit on investment? not just in this region, but globally as well? Well, we are a uh, European firm headquartered in London and try to take kind of a global view, which means, you know, the US, Europe, <coughs> and Asia. And I think we all agree that, you know, the new driver is clearly this region. I think there's no doubt with anybody. And when you look at that and you say, you know, what has really happened over the last, you know, let's say 10 years from the area before, then I think before 2000, there was a clear leader. That was the US. And, and why was the US so successful? I think the US had you know, political freedom, economic freedom, and they had one thing, which I think is what I'd like to elaborate a little bit more, is freedom of thought. And I think freedom of thought means that you can express yourself without putting yourself in danger if you say something. And if you take this region here, I think that's going to be the key point. Is this region able to develop into a region of freedom of thought? Meaning that you can express yourself in a meeting, in a political scenario, in an economic scenario, without jeopardizing your own position. And if you look at what's going on in the US at the moment around this whole financial crisis discussion, then I think the, the amazing thing is, you know, the discussions which are going on in TV, in Congress, in the Senate, all around the country where you know people are pointing the fingers they are looking for people have made the mistake and by doing that i think you slowly work the problems out of the system and you come out at the end and that's my personal opinion in with strength and if i look in this region here i don't quite feel that's happening yet and so that's my kind of throwing it into discussion here how do we get to this point of freedom of thought? Freedom of thought. What, a couple of you mentioned governments and the government's role in making this happen. Dominic, you were talking about education. 
how can governments help? What can governments specifically do with areas like education, which takes massive investment? I'm thinking particularly of countries like India, where it's very, very tight on the fiscal front. It's all very well talking about infrastructure, but how do you actually pay for this? How do governments actually raise that kind of cash? Dominic, do you want to speak to that for a minute? Sure. I think governments have an extremely important role to play because if you look at any of the, I mean, the whole public-private partnership notion, I think, is going to be a very, very important part of how to make things happen. If you look at India and the infrastructure requirements, they're, they're an order of magnitude of anything you've seen. But if you look at the amount of time it takes to actually get an approval for a particular project, the tendering process, the, frankly, the bureaucracy that you have to go through, that's going to have to get streamlined. And, uh, and so I think how, how government is able to set a framework to enable the private sector to play a role and, and also elements of the public sector dealing with risk, I think will make a big difference as to how quickly uh, countries move. I mean, we mentioned the, the Chinese example. I believe it was the case for the, the time when they decided they were going to invest in the stimulus package in railways to when they actually put the shovel into the ground was three months, which is, you know, is, a, is an unbelievable number. Now, there could be challenges, by the way, on the environment. Maybe they're not mm. doing as many of the checks and so forth, but I think there need, the government can play a very important role for private capital coming in to be able to streamline, if possible, some of those things and create more benefits. Deputy Prime Minister, perhaps you can address that same issue. How do, how do governments actually square that circle? Various governments do come under criticism for bureaucracy. India, I mean, I lived in India for four years and it was one of the perpetual themes of, wow, this bureaucracy is stifling. And even I think Richard Branson said, India is not an easy place to do business. Um, how, do, how do governments keep control but also liberalise at the same time? I mean, it's, it's a difficult... I agree with the point that uh, Dominic was, was made before that uh, there's no way that the government, especially the government of Vietnam, could spend the whole you know, national budget for the uh, investment of various sectors, you know, healthcare, education, infrastructures, and etc. So the point here is that if the government have the right, develop the right framework and the legal sort of system, in order to uh, call in the domestic and also the uh, foreign direct investment. Um, the government of Vietnam was actually working on this for a long time now, and we have developed a legal framework for the, the, the power sector to uh, encourage the private uh, investors in, 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 in the generation. So we have the, on the laws and decrees, in the uh, BUT, BOO, and BT, you know, development of, of, of the uh, generation. We're working with the World Bank and also the ADB now in developing the framework for the private uh, public partnerships in the transportation, like road and highway and uh, bridges and things like that. Um, even in the area where we see that it's difficult for the private sectors to uh, participate. You know, the government is trying to uh, encourage the private sector to join even part of that. You know, for instance, in the area of the education and the rural uh, transportation development, you know, the government could participate about 80 percent and whereby the private sectors will join in, you know, 20 percent. So various forms of the uh, capital investment uh, framework will be needed for the for the um, the government in order to uh, to encourage the investment for the economy of Vietnam is the the growth is coming from two pillars one is from the investment and the second one is from the uh, the export so the investment um, is, is, is very critical key for that and among the investment you know 40 45 percent is coming from the the, the FDI so in the year 2008, the government of Vietnam has attracted about 70 billion you know, U.S. dollars in the FDI, and uh, 2008 is coming, 2009 is coming down a little bit, but the government is trying to reform all the uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, 
domestic sort of legal framework in order to facilitate the, uh, the, the foreign direct investment. Bureaucracy eliminations, corruption eliminations, and applying the new technologies, reducing the delivery uh, time in the uh, various um, point of the infrastructure, things like that, would encourage the uh, private investors to uh, join in the development of the economy. And I agree with the, uh, the Dominic point made earlier also about the demand of the, the whole, you know, Asia market is still huge with, you know, a number of uh, young population and also the, the young middle class, uh, you know, population. That will be the driver force for the, uh, the Asia to continue to develop, uh, uh, you know, taking into account that the uh, Asian countries would need to adjust their, you know, uh, export-oriented model a little bit in order to, to fit with the new situation, whereby with more emphasis on a domestic market development. Thanks. If I may add, I think it's important to note that Asia is not monolithic. Uh, for those countries, particularly the developing markets, developing markets of Southeast Asia, uh, plus India, and possibly China, where there is a compelling and immediate need for huge infrastructure investment, uh, I think government's role should be prominent uh, and will continue to be important going forward. In the more developed markets, particularly here in East Asia, uh, Korea and Japan to name two, uh, I think the government's role is, uh, is more complex. Uh, certainly you need the fiscal stimulus package that, for example, the Korean government implemented I think successfully over the last six to nine months to pull itself out of the financial crisis. But I feel strongly that for uh, what are essentially, in my view, market problems, over the long term, there has to be solutions coming from the market by, the, by, by, the, uh, by private enterprise. I think the fiscal stimulus packages, which have been effective, uh, really, the goal should be to smooth out the pain and particularly to bail out um, the, you know, the markets in times of crisis. But over the long term, you can't have uh, the crutch of the government. Uh, you have to have the free market exercise its own muscles and get back on its feet by relying on its uh, market practices and market instincts. Can we talk about FDIs for a bit? FDIs came up. Where's the money coming from, Max? You know, that, that goes back to, to my earlier point. I think the money goes there where it feels it can also leave again. <laughs> and if you create a framework where you can, you're being let in, but you're not being let out, then, you know, the money is probably not freeing, flowing as freely as it could. And whereas, you know, until recently, the main flows of money came from, you know, the Western markets. This has obviously dramatically changed. It's now coming from the Middle East, it's coming from Russia, from China, from, you know, all sort of new emerging players. And I think that's, that comes down to this, this initial point, you know, they, they, these are all money flows which are not quite used to the same role kind of rules as, as the old money flows. Because if you take an American pension fund or you take a, a European pension fund or any of the other large investors, they had clear principles of governance and they knew what they were looking for. And it was really basically financial returns within a acceptable legal framework and also into companies which had accepted rules of how to play the game. And I think that's all changing at the moment. And I think we are in the middle of this change where, you know, if, if Europe screams and yells two years ago when they saw these sovereign wealth funds coming, because they felt like, you know, are they really having financial interests or what other interests are behind that? Now, because of the crisis, you know, people are welcomed in because they have no other choice. But as soon as the choice is available again, you will see certain barriers going up again and some flows will kind of go in other directions. And I think if this region here, which clearly has to take over a, a leading role going forward, also has to kind of consider these sort of points, and that gets back to the point of freedom of thought. What are you allowed to say? Mm -hmm. 
And we all know that to invest in these countries, you know, sometimes you cannot say what you really think because you really jeopardize your own position. So, uh, um, you know, uh, in addition to uh, what Dominic is saying, you know, what, what uh, this crisis has really taught us is that the world is really interconnected. There is no such thing as a local industry anymore. Everything is global. So when government spending their stimulus packages, obviously they're going to come with some sort of investment for infrastructure and others. And, but they can set the policies you know, that uh, a, a vice prime minister talked about. Um, and these policies has to set in such a way that encourages global competition. You know, a investment a money flow goes to a place where you think you have a fair shot at winning if you actually produce best solutions. And if you set the policies that protect local industry, local companies, then it's not a place where you want to go compete. I think that's very important. China. China's got a huge role to play in this recovery. I mean, can I just go around the table, if you like? And China is obviously of major importance to the world, but particularly to this region. I mean, Michael, how, for this, for Korea in, in general, what China does and how China deregulates at this very slow, gradual pace that it's doing. Do they need to accelerate that? Or is the sort of China five-year plan, if you like, going at the right pace for the rest of the world? Or should it speed up? I think directionally, certainly, uh, the Chinese policymakers are headed in the right direction. Uh, China, for the last 20 years, has grown uh, on a platform or used an engine of growth, uh, uh, used as an as engine of their growth exports. Uh, they, uh, in our uh, industry parlance, they really levered up uh, their percentage of exports as a, uh, uh, exports as a percentage of their GDP uh, increased twofold from 20% to 40% over the last two decades, even as the world trade, global trade, as a percentage of global GDP uh, increased over that time. So you had the double effect of uh, China's growth coming from, uh, from exports. I think the policymakers in China have recently rightly recognized that that can't continue and that it's a hazardous uh, path to continued growth. So they are consciously focusing more on domestic consumption, um, the Buy China slogan. Uh, so I think they're headed in the right direction I think the, uh, the growth of the domestic consumer in China, I suspect of the 800 million to billion new consumers that Dominic referred to, I suspect fully half of that, if not greater, comes from China. And China today is a country of two halves. You have the wealth concentrated all along the uh, urban areas of the eastern seaboard, and then you have the disenfranchised going inland. I think it's the consumers from the inland areas that are going to be potentially the future engine of growth for China and hence the world. Dominic, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, I mean, just building on what Michael's saying, I mean, clearly China, you can see most of, I think all Asian countries, China's now become the number one export market, right? There's just been a shift over the last five years. The consumer side we've, we've talked about, as Michael said, I think the consumer is roughly 35 or 36 percent of GDP. They want to go to 50. That's mm -hmm. going to create a lot of opportunities. I, I think the thing we all have to look at is how open will the Chinese market b be? This gets a bit to what Max was talking yeah. about. Will, can you, will you be allowed to compete and be a dominant player in that market? That's a question I think we need to see. I, I personally think that's it's important for Chinese industry as well to have the competition. I think on the banking sector, reform was classic. I think that the Chinese, in fact, learned from a lot of what happened in the Asian financial crisis and applied it. But a big part of that was listing the banks, the big banks, ensuring that there was the scrutiny that was required from outside, uh, and, in, and in terms of how they worked with some of those joint venture partners. But I think the degree to which foreign players can, can make China a second home market will be an important thing to watch, uh, watch over, the, over the coming years. And I mean, I've only been in China three odd months, but it seems to me the people I talk to uh, have a very long-term perspective, investment perspective. They're in China for the long haul. Having just left India, 
I mean, I met a lot of people in India that were there for the very short term. It's a very different dynamic, China, isn't it? If you put money into China, which is what Max, Max is talking about, you're putting it in for a long time. In countries like India, you're putting it in for a very short time. How do you think that dynamic will change in China? Do you think people will go in, start going in there on the shorter term as they liberalise? Because that will create a whole new set of opportunities for people. Max and Michael will be better than me on that, but I, because they're actually investing their own money uh, mm. in the places. But I, but I, I actually think you have to have a long-term view in every country. I, I mean, I think you need to be able to pull your money out. As Max said, there has to be that ability, or you know, what, why should you do it? There's a lot of people asking for it. But if you really want to get to be a, a player in any of these countries, I think you have to be long-term. And if you're a fly-by-night, you pu I, I, I watch with some. S you know, I don't know what, what the word is for it, surprise. The number of, there's some players that have come in r before the crisis hit, they're now pulling out. People remember that, and I think you, you, how can you build the kind of relationships and understanding of these markets which are developing so quickly unless you keep a long-term view on it? That would be my I, I do think, you know, if I may add, the, the long-term view in investments in any of our markets is, is important. Uh, and maybe even essential. But as a market develops, as China is, um, is doing inevitably, inexorably, uh, the capital has to become more dynamic and more fluid. Mm. Capital has to flow out of bad companies and be allocated and go into good companies. I mean, that's the basic principle of our markets. And I think uh, Max and I, you know, we have a very small role in that allocation of capital, but I do think one role that private equity capital plays is to be a, uh, a, a sharp, uh, you know, unrelenting, unrelentingly efficient allocator of equity capital because we go where the returns are. Uh, I think in times of crisis or at least dislocation like we're facing today, uh, your ability to assess the risk return uh, becomes paramount. And that's, I think, one of the few things that our industry is probably uh, pretty good at. So I think we will, uh, the alternative investment capital will play a role in reallocating capital as markets like China and India uh, become more mature. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister, you, you, you've seen these kind of capital flows flow into Vietnam and flow out as quickly. How, how do you as a government view that now? I mean, if you look at a graph of your stock market, it's up straight down. It well, came in and went out again. Yeah. Are you thinking about the future and money coming back into Vietnam, which it is, and what you do to try and to do what Max is talking about, to keep, keep hold of it and keep it in the country? Well, firstly, as I said that uh, in 2008, we were facing the situation of the, the world crisis. And for the first number of months of the 2008, the foreign indirect investment was reduced remarkable, remarkably from the figure of $8 billion to about $3 billion. It's all to do with the, um, you know, at the time also the uh, mo mobilizations of the fund from the public it was, was also very difficult. But it's also to do with the uh, credibility of the whole society to how the government will manage the financial and, 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 and banking uh, system. After a, a number of measures that the government showing to the public uh, that the government is capable of controlling the, um, uh, the financial and, and banking system, and the government is taking the lead and taking the responsibility over the public investment, you know, the uh, mobilization rate was coming back uh, to about 30 uh, percent. and. The retail markets, uh, based on that, is also increasing over time, and, and it has reached a figure of 21.5 percent. For the last number of months now, the stock market is also coming back, you know, increased by about 100 percent, and uh, increased by 100, you know, double the points. And also the uh, real, real estate market is also recovered by 20 percent. So it's all to do with how the, the government showing the public that the capability of, of managing the, the, the um, uh, financial and banking system. 
about the issues of China. China is, is the biggest, you know, trade partner of Vietnam. So we we see the China stimulus package, you know, doing its success will have the you know very very much positive impact to to Vietnam. And for the reason as a whole, as we said that the the whole Asian countries will have to uh, adjust their model from the uh, you know the the, the 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 export you know oriented model to reduce the dependencies uh, of their export to the international market. They will have to increase the intra sort of countries in the regions um, of, of trades and investments and also technology transfer things like that. They will have to have to see the Chinese and also the Indian, which is the biggest market in the regions, to develop. Uh, normally, so it will create the opportunities for the whole region to to continue to be the drivers for forces for the development of, of, of the, the whole world, world economy. Thank you. I'm going to throw it open to the floor now. So think of some questions, anyone with questions. But just before we open it to the floor, there's one question I really want to ask. Property. <laughs> All these crises seem to stem from real estate in one way, shape, or form. Savings and loans, Japanese property crisis, the mortgage crisis that happened before in this one. What role does property play in the recovery now in Asia? Max. I'm not sure that all these crises are really, you know, property kind of originated. But um, I mean, if you, if you refer to the US crisis, I think it was more a debt crisis than it, it just it happened to be that instrument. Yeah, exactly. But you know, <laughs> it could have gone into another instrument, I think another asset class. Um, and if you look around the region, you know, lots of wealth has been created through real estate. I mean, you know, Hong yeah. Kong, the place where I'm living is, is, is the classical example. And if you, if you go back to China, you know, if you talk, I think, to policymakers, they're not worried at all if Shanghai Stock Exchange goes up 60% and down 70%, but they're really worried once real estate prices mm. are tanking. And for the simple reason that, you know, you, you the, the first assets you start accumulating when you come out of poverty, I think, is real estate. And so, you know, if you buy an apartment or you own something and uh, not levered, you know, with equity like in China most people do, um, or with very limited uh, leverage, still, you know, that's how they see their wealth. And I think that's, you know, what caused this bubble in the US, you know, is because people thought they had a wealth which they didn't have. And, and, and so, yeah, the, the signals I see coming out of, of, of China is that the market is actually, you know, becoming quite active again, and, and that the prices are recovering, and deals start happening again, and and so, you know, I think that's an underlying kind of confidence factor, which is very important. Okay, questions from the floor. Um, here in the middle. Can you please tell us who you are and where you're from? Thank you. Pierre Coet from uh, Goodyear. In the context of moving towards new drivers of growth, there has been many calls towards unleashing domestic consumption. Um, in the 80s, the call was on Japan. Right now, the call is on China and a few other economies. Um, significant thoughts have been given on how do you drive towards the economy, the significant saving rates. Um, I will be uh, very interested by the thoughts of the panel related to health, education, uh, housing, retirement, and how those sectors could be maybe reformed uh, towards driving savings um, from this type of um, precautionary savings towards investment in the real economy and or uh, domestic consumption. Wow, that's quite a broad range of questions. Who'd like to take that? Hmm. Um, maybe just a couple of comments on it. I think it's a great point. I think that the key, in fact, to the getting the Chinese to buy more or to take that consumption rate from 35 or 36 to 50 is, that, is not so much the stimulation program on a rebate on the TVs or the scooters that they're buying. It's actually the social infrastructure. And if you look at you know, the, the savings in health care that are required because there is no health care system if you're in the rural part of China. You don't have money and someone in the family is sick, 
and they and and you you can't keep paying to keep them healthy you're kicked out of the hospital and it's a pretty brutal system so i think some of the reforms on health care have been actually key in the stimulus uh, package that's going on but it, it gets i think to a broader theme that you're bringing which is the development of financial markets i mean michael mentioned the markets have to work the fact of the matter is across across asia a little less so in japan and Korea, but even there, I would argue, from a financial market depth and development point of view, they're fairly underdeveloped markets. If you look at the insurance business as a business line across the region, it is a very underdeveloped a business on every dimension. Um, and so I think we also have to look at financial market reform actually to help with some of the social security reform to enable the, the savings and the consum uh, to, to drop and the consumption to go up. It's a, I think it's a terribly interesting question, and it ties back to uh, your question about the property bubble. If you consider what happened in the U.S. in this recent crisis, the way I view it is it started with the property bubble bursting. So I agree with you. That led almost immediately to the credit bubble burst. Uh, and then the big question was, the $10 trillion question was, will the consumer uh, bubble burst in sequence? When you have that kind of sequence, then I think that's economic or financial Armageddon. In closer to home here in Korea and in Japan, my fear a year ago was that the time period for that sequence of those three bubbles bursting was being contracted and that you would see almost a simultaneous bursting of the property, uh, credit, credit markets, and the consumer bubble bursting. Thankfully, it hasn't happened. Um, the, uh, the newspapers in Korea, you probably um, uh, read uh, this morning, the property market, uh, it, as exemplified in Gangnam area, the uh, wealthy area in Seoul, uh, the property prices are up 20% in the last couple of months. It looks like Korea is reversing the sequence, and we're not going to get to uh, the third bubble, the, the consumer bubble bursting. And I think that's absolutely critical to a sustained recovery of our regional markets uh, because it's the, again, the domestic consumption, uh, particularly domestic consumption in the large markets of Asia that will lead the global recovery. Yes, here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Masaki Romura. Uh, I'm from uh, Japan Bank for International Cooperation. My question um, maybe uh, should be addressed to Mr. Kim and uh, Mr. Car Calderon. Uh, my question is, and I fully agree with and, uh, Mr. Kim, uh, we should invest in the future. But uh, uh, in order to invest in the future, we need to uh, have proper review of current regime. And uh, uh, Mr. Calderon mentioned freedom of thought. And uh, based on freedom of thought, a lot of uh, different opinions are talking about the current economic system. And clearly, uh, something was wrong. And the uh, contribution of World Economic Forum uh, should be sent clear message what is wrong with current uh, mechanism. And th this would be uh, most greatest uh, contribution of East Asia. In my view, uh, as Mr. Kim mentioned, uh, current regime uh, lacks uh, long-term perspective and proper recognition of government, uh, public sector. And uh, as uh, Mr. Smith mentioned, sometimes uh, government uh, lacks the efficiency, but then, uh, in order to have a long-term view, the government's role is essential. Uh, what to uh, think about this? Uh, World Economic Forum should, clear, uh, should send a clear message what's wrong with the current uh, uh, regime. I agree wholeheartedly with the premise of your question. I think the um, American capitalism model that we know and love is broken. I think this crisis uh, brought that to the, to the fore. Um, I think here in Asia, uh, as we think about adopting uh, the American uh, free market model, it's important to note that 
there has to be a, uh, an Asian, there has to be a better model, and I think the better model entails having a localized Asian model of capital, capitalism. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore is famous for saying that uh, you know, we should be adopting not the American uh, form of democracy, but an Asian democracy. And I think his point was you can't simply pluck a plant from America, transplant it in Korea or Japan or Singapore, and expect it to flourish. The, the soil, the, you know, the, the weather conditions, the water, uh, they're all very different uh, locally. So I think you have to do uh, the same sort of localization and customization for the capitalist, for the model of uh, uh, free market economy uh, that we've all adopted here in Asia. And I think certain elements of that Asian model of capitalism, uh, you point out, I agree completely. It's a uh, long-term perspective. It's some role for the government. I think, uh, as I mentioned before, the government's role should be accentuated uh, or expanded in times of crisis like today. Uh, when the situation stabilizes, I think the government has to work hand in hand with, uh, with, the, with the markets. I also think uh, this is more towards Korea than Japan, but I think uh, the issue of labor unions uh, is also a factor that you have to consider. Uh, it just isn't a factor in the U.S. So I do think you have to customize and develop our uh, own uh, model, uh, Asian capitalism, if you will, because the old model, the U.S. model, is simply broken. I, I'd like to give this a slightly different spin. I think it's, it's, the question is all about leadership. And, um, and I think the so-called American capitalistic system had, um, let's put it carefully, questionable leadership before the new leadership came on board with Barack Obama. If you take the Chinese system, and I always call myself a student of China, and uh, I'm up to lesson seven, and perhaps I make it up to lesson 35 before I die in a study of 100 lessons. So not, I'm not pretending to be an expert, but I'm, I'm Swiss, so I'm coming out of a deeply democratic, complicated system. And I actually see a lot of similarities between the Chinese system and the Swiss system, I have to say. If you see how decisions are being made, how, you know, how they have to calibrate, how they try to bring everybody on board before something happens is actually deeply democratic and has nothing to do with, you know, kind of dictatorship and, and is, is the furthest away can be from dictatorship. And, and I think, you know, there are, there's no one or the other system. It's all about, you know, how you elect your leadership. And I have to say, I have deep respect for everything I've seen for Chinese leadership because they, they have plans, they tell exactly what they're going to do, and they stick to them. I think there's no other government where you can actually download the five-year plan, and after five years, you see they have actually done what they said. And for business, I think there's nothing better than that, if you, if you know what you're up to. And they also tell you what you're not supposed to do. And, you know, like in any game, you have to stick to the rules. Otherwise, you shouldn't play the, the you know, you don't have to try to change the game if you don't like the, the rules of the game. And so, I think, you know, with this, this leadership, you see, and I think China is clearly the number one nation because it's the largest in this region, and the leadership they have, I'm actually extremely optimistic for the whole region because of that, and not because of the system this or the system that. Yeah, I'd like to jump in too. I think it's, it's fun, but it's dangerous to sort of talk about, you know, the capitalist system being broken or let's, what are you going to replace it with? And, and I think there are many things that need to be improved. I'm more where Max is in terms of, I think there's leadership that wasn't exercised properly. But if you look at the number of crises that the world has had, financial crises that we've had, you look at Kindleberger's book, Manias, Panics, and Crashes. Every time there was a crisis, he went back another 50 years. We, it, this happens. And I think what we need to do is look at what are the, what are the mechanisms that went wrong in, in the process. And I think the thing I would come to is look at, it was actually the World Economic Forum, it was Wen Bao. I thought, making one of the best speeches I've heard in the last uh, 24 months, talking about Adam Smith. He was lecturing many of the business leaders in the world about 
what Adam Smith wrote in The Wealth of Nations and what the invisible hand meant. And if you look at that and you look at what Adam Smith was talking about, there, I would argue there are many Asian values in that, which is the invisible hand is not about greed somehow leading to the Pareto optimal outcome. The invisible hand was as business leaders, you should be careful about the poor and help the poor and you have a role in society to play in what you're doing. That's from his original book, The Moral Sentiments. And so when we categorize things as capitalism or not, we should, I think, look at, at, the, at the core of it and then look at is it, is it the system or the leadership of the system and what checks and balances need to be in place uh, to try and make it better versus throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, <laughs> let's go over the back there. Thank you for, uh, th thank you for recognizing me. Uh, talking about the poor, having been reassured that the Asia is going to lead the recovery globally, I was just wondering, listening to the panel, that this new recovery, how much the other Asia, the marginal Asia, which I'd go, go on talking about, the poorer Asia is going to share in, because most part of the poorer Asia has also been hit or a, with a delayed response or a lagged response on, the, on these economies. So they are losing their market in Europe and US. Can they redirect their exports to this new Asian growth and share in? Can they also resource their remittance flow from this part of the world? Uh, can they benefit also from the stimulus packages which has been unleashed in these countries? Or the other way of looking at it, can they benefit from the new flow of foreign direct investment or equid capital from these sources and replacing them from those coming from Europe and US? What kind of prospect is there? Jung, I wonder, do you want to take this from a corporate point of view? Probably not the best person to. Uh, yeah, um, no, I was just wondering from a, from, from a company point of view, when <clears throat> when you talk about the poorer members of society, companies play a huge well, role in bringing. You know, a, that uh, clearly as uh, a company, sober strategy, we are trying to figure out how to liberate, uh, you know, a billion people who still even have a basic phone. So, um, we try to drive a innovations so that the cost of entry, cost of you know, solutions and product is affordable for, for those. When people are actually connected to the technology world, then they can actually move up in the ladder. And uh, in the process of trying to create a solutions for the masses, for the poor people, for the poor nations, you actually have to be quite creative. You have to be um, quite advanced in terms of technology to be able to get there. So um, I think companies like ours, you know, during the crisis like this, um, we are forced to think about that, so that's good. Now, with regards to your questions about uh, other, a more wealthy, more developed nations in Asian countries, we help other um, a less fortunate um, countries around this, this region. I mean, I don't think, I, you know, I don't have a really good perspective on that. Deputy Prime Minister, I must come to you on this. What, what, <laughs> what, what roles can richer nations play for, for developing countries, particularly in this region? Well, in a I, very practical sense. Yeah, I think that the uh, the crisis is calling for a number of the solutions which people are more uh, concentrating in developing their domestic demands and domestic market. And based on that, you know, a lot of the stimulus uh, sort of package is concentrating on developing the, the uh, rural area and also concentrating on the development of the uh, that in, in, in adjusting the poor. But actually, uh, before the crisis, you know, uh, uh, lots of governments is having a, um, a very, uh, you know, comprehensive uh, long-term program in the poor alleviations. And amongst that, Vietnam was, was, was embarked on that for 20 years of doing more, and we bring down the poor rate of the countries from the uh, figure of 30% to uh, 10 point uh, 4% in 2008. And we see that as the, um, you know, also in the years to come, we see that the poor alleviation is the 
one of the measures to, to help the countries to stimulate their domestic demands and to reduce their risk in uh, development of the, their, their economy as well. Thank you. <coughs> Questions? Here at the front. Thank you. Um, I would like to just uh, make some comments about uh, Max's earlier point about freedom of uh, thought. Um, when, when we look at the uh, U.S. and East Asia, I see a very big difference. Um, U.S. does very well in terms of uh, embracing diversity, em embracing uh, different opinions. And when you look at East Asia, it's very homogeneous population. Uh, it has a highly well-educated uh, labor force and very efficient bureaucracy. Last week, um, I was in Beijing and I was asking some questions to a Chinese lady saying, um, what's the most uh, preferred um, occupation for the, uh, the husbands in, in, in terms of a Chinese lady? And she immediately said it's government officials, hmm. followed by doctors and lawyers. And, and we hear these answers in Korea as well, and it, this is very uh, unique. You don't see these um, top, you know, talents going into the uh, public sector in, in, in Western countries. So we have a very uh, different model. And as uh, East Asia takes more of a global leadership, I think uh, it's, it's really the time that we um, look at ourselves and try to shift our gears and what kind of lessons and what kind of leadership uh, East Asia wants to exercise. And um, one area that we should really work on is um, the intellectual leadership. And the second area, I think, will be the uh, communication, uh, effectively communicating um, the leadership and the vision of the leadership to the rest of the world. Thank you. It's a good point. It's government jobs. Do you want to talk about that, Michael, from an East Asia point of view, that mindset? Uh, I, I agree completely. I, I think the uh, the respect that's accorded to uh, jobs in government uh, is probably a legacy of uh, the Confucianism uh, thread that that binds uh, at least the markets of North Asia, the countries of North Asia together. I think as the um, the intellectual power of uh, the Asian countries grows, uh, I think it'll have um, an important role to play on the global scene. I do think, though, the one thing America gets right is higher education. Uh, I think, you know, we talked about uh, how health education welfare has broken down in certain parts of the world. Uh, I might challenge the U.S. on that point. Uh, I don't think they are a, the U.S. today, as I know it, is a top class uh, health education welfare country. But on one thing, that the one segment of the E, the education, which is higher education, university and, uh, and graduate school, um, I think there's no, no country even close. And it's awfully important that, to recognize that even as the, the peoples of East Asia emphasize the importance and the value of uh, of learning and scholarship that still much of the learning, the education uh, in, in the higher levels is still coming out of the West and the U.S. in particular. So I think there has to be, continue to be a East-West partnership in, um, in intellectual leadership. But I think what, what the lady picked up, which I think is an important point, is, is she said communication and basically you know, spreading the message, and and I think it has to do with language, um, and it's, it's you know it's extremely tough for all of us who ever try to learn one of the Asian languages. You know, it's a real exercise, and um, I think it's just easier to learn English, mm -hmm. and and since English has become kind of the global language, anybody trained in an English education system has some kind of a communication advantage, and that's what you always see. I mean, when you mm -hmm. listen, and and I think. That's where the more these countries become important on the global scale, more young people will learn these languages. Actually, my oldest son lives in Beijing and speaks Putonghua, and he went there because you know he, he realized this is important. And so there's a whole generation coming, which is you know our kids, which are around 25 and 
which grow up in this environment. And I think in 20 years, we'll have a whole different communication going because they, they will be at ease to talk to each other, which we not necessarily are. Yeah, there's someone struggling with Mandarin at the moment. I can point to that. <laughs> yes, here. Morning, everyone. Uh, Lionel from Singapore. Um, I'd like to ask two related questions based on two points raised by the panel. I think this morning we've heard um, a lot about how China will lead the um, global recovery. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, for, for the sake of debate, um, in substituting the US with China, what happens when China does a Homer Simpson on the world economy? Um, my second uh, question is related to a point that Kim raised. Um, I think you mentioned that the recovery uh, will be based on consumerism in East Asia. Um, East Asia definitely includes more than just China. Um, so how can East Asia, which includes Vietnam, which includes India, um, and the other parts of uh, the ASEAN, increase consumerism that then contributes to the recovery uh, of the global economy. Thank you. Homer Simpson does a lot of things. <laughs> Do you want to take that, Tom? Hmm. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what Homer Simpson is, is up to, but I presume it's a mistake or something bad. It could it could happen. But I, you know, I um, I think one thing we should just get in mind while we're talking about the Chinese consumer driving things forward, we should realize on a relative scale, even if we get a 35 to 50 percent increase, that amount of magnitude in terms of improved uh, consumption, therefore growth, is minuscule compared to the drop of what we're seeing in, in the U.S. and actually from the OECD billion. It's just the reality. So I don't, China is not unfortunately going to power us out of this under any circumstance, in my view, over the next uh, five to ten years, just given where, where the wealth is. That said, I, I do think there's a lot that can be done across the region. I agree it's not just China. India has a large place to play. The Vietnam has a lot. Indonesia, we don't talk a lot, about, a lot about Indonesia. I'm actually a bull on Indonesia. We've got over 200 million people. That's a, been a pretty stable place for a while with lots of resources and lots of people. So I think that they will uh, continue to play a role. And I think it gets back to Pierre's comment about you have to have, you know, to get people to buy more, we can't just tell them to do it. We can't just give them money. Um, I think it relates around the social security side. Health care pension reform is, ver is very important. I think it's interesting to see the Paul Keating, who I think played a key role in the Australian uh, superannuation program, spending a lot of time in China, you know, mm -hmm. going back, trying to help uh, with, the, with, that, uh, with that system to get it in place. So getting the social security is, in, is key. And then I think on the consumer finance side, there's, as I said before, many things missing. We need the credit bureaus you, to be able to evaluate those risks. We know from our experience in Hong Kong, Korea, and Taiwan what can happen when you have a consumer bubble. It's ugly. And so I think when we have this billion coming in, we need to make sure we have the infrastructure in place so that we can provide credit properly and ensure more stable growth. I think the key, the key point is what, what Dominic said now and before, and I think McKinsey also has done studies on that, explaining what the savings rate really means if you take out education and, and health care. And then actually the savings rate is not that great. So it's all through that system that you turn this more into a consumer society. I, like I, I do think a little bit uh, about the uh, comments being made about the increasing role of China in not only leading recovery but perhaps uh, you know, a, uh, becoming more dominant in the a, a, uh, world economy. Uh, it feels like you know a people are pretty much discounting or counting out U.S. Um, I live in the U.S. I have seen. What, what you know the, the country can do. And I just want to remind these people here that uh, we had a very similar discussions not so long ago when Japan was a rising power. I remember clearly the discussions about how Japanese government led by MIRI, centralized planning, focus on developing artificial intelligence, memory, you know, 
and high definition TV and so on and was going to overtake US and whatnot. Clearly, that's not how it happened. Um, now, China's growth fueled by you know, the export-led industry by supply of low-cost labor and whatnot, and clearly there's momentum. But in my view, the future is uncertain. The future is yet to be played out. And the, any kind of protectionism, any kind of a, a restrictions on freedom of thought, you know, a risk-reward system that is necessary that uh, allow you to try again if you fail, and those kind of a, uh, basic um, a ingredient that is absolutely necessary for a uh, you know, sustaining long-term growth, I haven't quite seen. And it will eventually come, but I haven't quite seen it. So I'm not as, uh, I'm a little bit more cautious, let's say. Did you want to add something like that? Uh, yes, uh, well, to address the point about uh, uh, consumerism, I, I, I do think that consumerism has to go hand in hand with democratization. Uh, particularly in our countries in Asia, uh, many are going through the uh, democratization uh, trajectory. And I think it's awfully important to have the freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly that are the hallmarks of a true democracy. And again, I don't mean it has to be in Asia a U.S. style democracy. It can be an Asian kind of democracy going hand in hand with uh, Asian model of capitalism. But I'm referring more to uh, what George Soros calls an open society, where there's uh, open pu uh, public discourse, and again, you, are, uh, you have the freedom of communication that uh, marks any open society. So I think the growth in uh, consumerism has to go, and uh, my prediction is it will go hand in hand with uh, the burgeoning uh, democracies of Asia. Time for one more question. Yes, here. Um, since this is about the drivers of growth, uh, in Asia there have been cycles of growth that have been driven by, a uh, long time ago, Japanese capital uh, that then was extended to the rest of Asia, but then that made the rest of Asia vulnerable to a strengthening of the yen. And we've certainly seen in the last year what kinds of currency turmoil can occur uh, still in this region. And it seems that this region has not really figured out what the answer to that problem is, particularly if we're about to see a cycle maybe of Chinese capital extending to the rest of the region, but then vulnerable to a strengthening of the yuan. Uh, and so what would, in an ideal world, your prescriptions be for solving that problem? Who wants to take that? And are we going to get into the whole dollar debate? Max, you want to take a pop on that? Well, I mean, you know, it's obviously a very difficult question, so I mean, <laughs> It's hard to give an intelligent answer, but um, I think, you know, to boiling it down, it's about currencies, and um, which I think you're addressing. And exchange rates are something which are the hardest thing to predict, and all companies have also hedging programs, and sometimes they go wrong, sometimes they go right. But if you, if you, if you let the markets actually set the prices, then you have a lot less anomalies and disasters and if you try to block a certain movement for some time and then you can't hold it anymore and all of a sudden it blows up and I think the last financial crisis was very much a thing like that and I think that's where the region has learned a huge amount and this time amazing I mean you know nothing really happened and and if you take the India, Indonesian rupee or, or any of the other currencies which you thought would be very very vulnerable last October or September, you know, they made it through because they let the money flow and they didn't try to hold anything back. So I think, you know, a lot of people learned a lot and, and they keep on learning. So I, I, I don't think that's that much of a risk, but you know, what do I know? Okay, we better wrap it up there because um, we're getting close to lunchtime. Um, I think my big takeaway from this is a billion more consumers coming on the market. Um, but needing to feel safe enough 
in their lives to actually consume. And also the whole freedom of thought and freedom of movement and safety issues around investment, I think, are the most important. And these were issues that were around at the time of the Asia crisis and have been addressed to some extent. Um, but hopefully this will take you to the next step. Thanks very much to the panel. Just to let everybody know, um, the dinner, which is across the hall, is hosted by His Excellency, Excellency the Deputy Prime Minister. Nice Vietnamese food. So straight across the hall, please. <laughs>